love, hate, self-consciousness. Do you know they're so beautiful and they tell the story so well. And creativity is first of all being able to express yourself. sometimes very hard for me uh, to structure my thoughts and being able to express it verbally it is much easier for me to express it visually it's a way of expressing my overwhelming thought process out into the world always was an artist I don't know whether I wanted or not as a child but I was I think everyone is in one way or another the difference is uh, whether we choose to suppress it or develop it and because I was lucky enough to grow up in a very creative environment so I chose to develop it however I never thought that it would be my profession but uh, I, I don't think you can escape it. That's part of your DNA. That's who you are. So I come from a very sort of classical, traditional art. I used to paint a lot of architectural paintings, and that's more technical. You divide the canvas in your head, and it's ready. With abstract art, it's different. It's a bit more challenging, which is again more exciting because you are alone with that canvas at that specific moment and you have that internal dialogue then you let the lines sort of guide you and direct you so for me the biggest challenge is still to let go of the technical part or that automatic structuring of the canvas a very personal and unique things every single crack tells us a story or every single wrinkle tells us who you are and where you have been and then I see fear self-consciousness hate and empathy I almost want to humanize them in my work I think my obsession with it is connected to the role of women in the world because nature to me is female and how it is pushing through culture and reminds me of how strong nature is no matter how much we try to hide it or cover it or demolish it it always pushes through and it always wins Also in the art world I think it's quite uh, tough because it's so so closed off and you always have to be conscious about what you wear how you perceive so I think of me facing the art world and how hard it is to break through as a woman pushing through those cracks To me, it's about men conquering things, trying to prove their strength to each other or to themselves. Whether for women, it's, it's, a, it's a different approach. Go and get pleasure out of it rather than pain out of it. A lot of what women do and how they do it come from their intuition. In my work as well, intuition come into play. However, even if it's a completely abstract work and I let it flow, the rational approach still comes to play at the end. You have to be able to combine these two parts to create something. In my case, it's a work of art. The 
process itself is what excites me the most. I enjoy that transformative development, making shapes come together and watching them evolve. I produce something on the canvas and then I wait for the canvas to direct me or to show me something in return. It shows demons within you, but it also shows the struggle of trying to remove those demons. And that's why I think I use a lot of contrasting colors, because it shows that constant battle within yourself. My technique is element-based and I tend to use my bare hands quite a lot when working with oils and acrylics just because I need to feel the, the paint to truly adjust its texture. I tend to coat thin layers on top of one another which allows for the original underlayer to, to seep through and show itself. I also use tapping techniques quite a lot with flat brushes uh, just to generate that realistic landscape. I use grey as a main colour. Grey and white, they allow other colours to be seen properly. For example, if you paint red on top or next to blue, sometimes it can appear orangey. However, if you paint red next to grey, you'll be able to fully appreciate the real red. You know, they say that the artwork is never finished. I don't think it's the case. I know when it's done, because there is a time, look at the whole composition and you know, that's it, I cannot touch it anymore. Maybe it comes from experience, because before I used to tweak and change the painting and then you will spoil it and it's very hard to look at a spoiled painting but before it happens I usually leave my painting to sit for a month or two uh, you always have to come back to it to, to make sure that it is done I finish something but I feel like it needs a continuation and then it goes on to my next canvas my aim, what I'm trying to achieve, I think, is to be able to identify with the viewer. I want you to see your inner world and outside world and the dialogues between your two worlds. Well, that was lovely. Uh, that was Backstage. Uh, it's a film by Anya San, directed by Emmanuel uh, Wevo. Um, Anya, I, I want to start the discussion with you. It, it is an evocative, nuanced film. Um, just before we had that screening, you talked a little bit about um, what went into to making it. But uh, I just wonder, I mean, we already get a sense of your body of work and it is broad you've exhibited internationally um so why make uh, a film like this uh well it's also me trying another medium uh for my art uh uh, experimenting with it, although I do not really like this word experimenting because I feel that somehow it undermines uh, the work. Um, but also there's so many things, as I said in the, in the film, that I cannot express verbally when I get to talk about my work, um, but I, I express it visually. However, in this particular film, I wanted to address things verbally, combining with visual effects and have that impact sort of to make it heavier, if it makes sense. You do talk um, uh, a bit about how, how you approach your art. And I should say one, my backing is one of the, the 
paintings that you saw in the film. This, this is Waterfall. This is one of my favorites. But I was really struck mm -hmm. by um, one of the, the lines uh, in, from the film when you said that you're alone with the canvas. That's how you describe abstract art to you. I mean, there's, there's a real um, sense in the film of, of a struggle to break through as an artist as well. I mean, is it a very lonely process for you? Uh, it is a lonely process. I think for, for artists in general, sort of that sense of loneliness and lockdown in a way is very normal. Uh, we have to, I think, step away from the background noise, right? And, and concentrate on that work. And it's not going to happen unless you're there with it. Uh, and you don't let anything else to distract you. So lo lonely doesn't necessarily mean bad. Um, it's just part, part of the process when it comes to creating artworks. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned the lockdown. We are going to have to talk about about the impact of the pandemic in a moment. But um, uh, you also talk about when you produce something on the canvas. These are these are your words. You wait for the canvas to direct you, to show you something in return, to show the demons within you. I mean, it's also a mystical process as well in the way that you describe it. Uh, it is, yes. And in, for me, there is a lot of symbolism in any art, and especially when it comes to my artwork. Um, and I do like to play with lines. So it's all very much depends on your internal world and how you feel at that moment and how you develop the painting, how you follow that line. We will, talk, um, we will talk a little bit more about your process um, uh, towards the end, but I want to move on to the nature of being an artist because a, a central theme uh, in your film is that, is that struggle. Uh, this is uh, the way you describe it. Um, there's, there's a section in the film you talk about the industry being closed off, that you're conscious of how you're perceived and how hard it's been to break through as a woman. I mean, we will bring um, Kate in here in this discussion, but first, Anya, if I can have you just describe some of the experiences you've had trying to break through as a female artist. <laughs> Where do I start? Um, there are so many. And um, for example, the, I think the biggest issue is not being paid for your work, uh, which I find, I mean, it puzzles me in this day and age in London. Uh, so many artists, every artist I know uh, has been going through a time in their life when they were not paid for their work and their time. So unless you have some kind of financial backup, uh, to support you, you will not be able to do that work. And if you have that financials backup, you, you are doing it hoping that you'll be supported by some great gallery or an art collector. But even though you cannot afford it and you try to do it, you go through those hardships. Um, and, uh, you know, but then when you have a family or a child, you can no longer do uh, things like that. So things that you're ready to do to yourself, you cannot do on your children. So again, it, it sort of, it cuts you off from that race of making it in the art world, right? I mean, some, some uh, of your experiences um, uh, have been around being a parent and being judged by, for the way that you look. Can you just describe some of those experiences so we, we have a, a sense of, of what you've been through. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I have been told on multiple occasions that I cannot have a family if I want to succeed as an artist. I think that having a family doesn't just, it doesn't sit well uh, with the image of an authentic artist. Uh, in terms, of, I have been, uh, when I was pregnant with my son, for example, I had to hide it for as long as it was physically possible in order to still be invited to certain art events, uh, not to be written off as a, you know, upcoming new mother who won't be able to produce any work. 
Uh, then also there is this constant judgment and critique about how I look uh, that varied from being too young, uh, being too pretty, not pretty enough, uh, not being sexy enough, being too overdressed, being too political, and it goes on. Uh, it, it doesn't stop. So you constantly feel that panic and pressure. Okay, what do I wear? How do I fit in? How, you know, how do you conduct yourself in order to fit into that sort of dress code of being an authentic artist? Um, this, these are just a few of my sort of examples from my life. Kate, just listening to that, how, how much of these experiences are unique to what to what Anya uh, has gone through and how much of it is is a feature of the industry. I, I think um, Anya is sort of spot on. I mean, every every artist that I interview, that I speak to, that I do research on talks about very, very similar experiences, I think. And then there's also that sort of added layer of precarity around kind of the freelance nature of being an artist. So in the UK, you can expect to earn on average about £16,000 a year, which is, of course, below the minimum wage. Um, and, you know, and obviously there's people earning a lot more than that, but most people are earning a lot less than that from their practice. So if, if you don't have that inherited privilege that, that Anya's talking about, that makes that incredibly difficult. And, and that seems to marry with the same kind of career stage um, that people are often choosing to have families. So, you know, you might spend your 20s kind of, you know, going to art school, you know, forging ahead, trying to get all of those contacts and those networks that Anya's talking about. And then you might decide when you're about 30 that you're going to have children and it sort of unravels all of that work. And I think for, for most people in the industry, even people that kind of claim to support the cause of, of, of equality, the image in people's unconscious mind of an artist is still a white European man. And so you have that obstacle, even before you've got children, of trying mm. to kind of counteract that, that bias in people's minds. Um, a few years ago, I undertook um, a series of interviews with gallery directors in London, and all of them said that for them, the biggest obstacle for, for women was, was having, having children. And, and, and one of the directors even suggested that, that they saw it as a bit of a risk um, to take on an artist of childbearing age because they're likely to sort of, you know, run off to the countryside and have children and, um, and, and that, that that might unnerve collectors, that they might see that as, um, as a sort of a flight risk in a way. I mean, do women that don't choose to have children have the same sort of prejudices that hamper their career? Well, it's, you know, I mean, you, you may have heard that sort of famous quote by Tracy Emin that said oh, yeah. um, uh, that, you know, um, there are lots of great um, parent artists out there and they're all men. Um, and, you know, and it's quite, it, it, you know, I, I mean, she made that very deliberate choice to not have children. And I, so I think a lot of women do internalise that kind of um, conservatism in the industry and and feel, as Anya pointed out, that there is a choice to be made between being an artist or being a mother. And um, and it's not the same thing for uh, male artists, you know, that, that's not in their, in their mind thinking that that is going to affect their career um, in the same way. So I think it, it, all, all, um, all obstacles are intersectional, you know, whether, you know, you've, you've come from a non-English speaking background, you're an immigrant, you're, um, you know, you, uh, you're kind of, you're not cisgender, um, uh, you know, you're a parent. I think, you know, Anya's got an incredible wealth of experience that arguably makes her work complex and interesting and, and rich. Um, but in fact, it's many of those um, aspects of Anya's background and personality that equally um, are kind of challenges or obstacles to success. Is this, though, inherent in the art industry because art is inherently about perception? Is, is this the, the sort of uncomfortable truth about, about the art that it's going to be a little more vulnerable to this kind of unconscious bias that, that you're describing from, from gallery owners and the way they judge artists. Because in a way, 
uh, the choices that these people make about the product are, are emotional or, or, or is that just an excuse? Well, it, it's emotional, but it's also about investment. So it, buying art, supporting art is a speculative experience um, and, a, and a speculative process, just like buying stocks or shares or property or, you know, there's, there's an aspect of speculation of weighing up what the risks are, what the, what the possible return is and so on. And so if we look at auction records, for example, um, you know, only 10% of, of works going to auction are by women, even though 70% of uh, people going to art school are women. So that there is there is something that happens in that career trajectory where you where you look at the beginning of a career, which is predominantly by female artists, and then you look at the sort of the, the other end, the auction records, which you know you know typically are um, you know uh, dead or near dead artists. Um, and it's predominantly men. So there's something that happens there along that route. And, you know, and being a parent is a big part of that. But, you know, there are also these other things. But, um, you know, I just sort of think that collectors and institutions, they don't, um, you know, they, they, there is a risk there that, that they perceive, which I think is entirely um, unfounded, because I think actually, as we can see from Anya's films, she, you know, a lot of artists work incredibly hard. And, yeah. and that, you know, it, it, it's not based in any reality. And in fact, if there were things in support of women, particularly around exactly. parenting. Yeah, it's like a vicious circle. If we had more support uh, and not being written off from the art industry completely because you want to have a family, then you wouldn't give up. Like so many times I felt like I've had enough of this art world. I'll paint for myself. I'm not getting involved in it anymore. And this is why I can see so many women artists moving into, you know, to the countryside and having a family without having to fight mm. against this wall that doesn't break. Um, How have you been able to keep going, Anya? Because what Kate is describing and what you've described just seems insurmountable. It, it seems exhausting. <laughs> It is exhausting, but it's a labor of love. On the other hand, it's something who you are and you cannot, how, no matter how much you try, and I do try to kind of stop this, uh, you cannot stop it because it's what you love doing and this is who you are, it's in your DNA and you keep on doing it. Uh, and for me, something that I, when I just had my kid uh, two months later, I had an exhibition, international exhibition, and then I had another exhibition. When I should have been enjoying that precious time with a child, just to prove uh, that I, you, you're not writing me off, I'm still there, I'm still working. Thank goodness I had the financial backing and where I could afford to do things and I could, you know, my husband was very, you know, supportive and um, staying at home uh, with our little one. But again, why should I have to do that in this time in my life when I should be enjoying those moments? Um, we, we will come to discussing what poss possible solutions but I feel like I mean you mentioned lockdown earlier I we I feel like we have to talk about the pandemic and the impact on the pandemic and we we can talk about uh, a lot of the the negatives gallery spaces closed but have there been positives in this context has an, in a sense has it taken the pressure off with these expectations and you've been able to focus on your art even perhaps focus on you know, pr promoting your art through through the website and, and operating from home in that sense? Um, to me, absolutely. I think I even felt guilty about it, about, you know, having to see so much bad caused by, by the pandemic, but enjoying it in a way in the sense that I have a perfect excuse not to go to all these events and not to have all of those meetings, but produce work and I have done so actually I have produced a lot of work I secured this uh, an exhibition uh, with the smallest gallery in Soho which was fantastic and it was a live uh, performance and it went very well which kind of lead, led me to uh, opportunities of other live performances in London um, so to me, there was a positive, definitely. And also 
being able to just think and analyze things and and uh, sort of see what's really important and what do you value and how do you want to go forward. Um, it was quite a sort of imp important time in my life. Yeah, when I was, sorry, yeah. I was just going to say, when I was watching your film, Anya, I was really struck by a lot of the things that we were thinking about during lockdown was our connection back to nature. It was the sort of yes. slowing down. It was that observation. Yes. There was a real sense of, of what a lot of us did during that time was kind of revalue you know, what we were filling our minds and our lives with. And there was a real connection, I think, for me, watching that and thinking about the practice of walking and the practice of, of yes. slowing down and the practice of being in nature and, and so on. And I think um, it's really interesting to think about the different aspects of, um, or positives and negatives of, of the pandemic on artists, because of course, artists actually, they're quite used to their own company, as you were saying, Anya, aren't they? We're used to being in our studio, we're used to being on our own. And there's something quite um, regenerative and, and restorative about, about that alone time. But I think what I've seen, I've been doing a research project that looks at the impact of, of the pandemic on female artists mm. in the UK. And it, there has been read, there's been a lot of people that have had that experience, but it's only been in cases where they've been financially able to have that experience. Exactly. So, so, so many artists, of course, are, um, you know, they're relying on kind of part time casual, you know, income, which, of course, mostly all dried up during yep. the, the pandemic um, or if they had to homeschool. So. You know, it really depended on um, people's personal circumstances and existing obstacles like not having enough money or having loads of kids to look after yeah. or whatever just actually became extent, uh, uh, accentuated during the pandemic. And it, so it's really it, interesting to hear, um, hear your experience of that. I mean, presumably you were homeschooling as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, that was a torture, but yeah. <laughs> get the kids to get involved in the art, oh, hand them a paintbrush. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I have to ask, as, as I'm listening to you both, I just wonder how we can define success as an artist. I mean, it doesn't have to be financial success or is it, no, you know, notoriety and, and legacy and fame? Because there's always this uncomfortable sort of coexistence between the purity of the process but then the reality of having to survive and hopefully thrive from enough of a, an income. Um, I, I think it's important to, 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 to make money on your work, any work that you do, uh, and uh, including art. And we have to get comfortable with paying artists and being paid and talk about it because it's your work at the end of the day. And it's not just your work work it's sort of you put your soul into it um so i think as pure as it is it has to be paid for and uh, this is something also that i'm studying and trying to to round in my dissertation for san martins is how to make that cultural enterprise work and be sustainable so financially sustainable um yeah yeah Kate, no, I, 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 I totally agree with you Anya and I think there are so many aspects of our lives as our life of our lives as artists where we're not being paid so if you imagine um you know a gallery rings you up and says you know we'd like to have a meeting with you um, to discuss this project now if you were a lawyer you'd go great no problem that's 200 pounds an hour for meeting with me Thank you know, you. If, yeah. It, yeah, if you were, if you were, um, you know, and then they say, fantastic, we want to put on an exhibition, they'd go, great, and here's a £5,000 fee, because that's going to take you two months to make that work. You know, that doesn't happen. So mm. often, we're producing content for galleries, institutions, all of, full of people on salaries, and we're producing yeah. their content for free, with the yeah. hope that maybe we'll sell something. So that's yes, the financial exactly. model, right? And so, you know, whether it's um, 
you know, uh, um, you know, being asked to do talks, being asked to, um, uh, you know, uh, contribute. Few rapes, yeah. Few, all these sorts of, I mean, there's no payment structure. And what's really interesting in the UK is that even pub publicly funded organisations and institutions, there's no requirement um, or there's no proviso attached to that funding that artists will be paid. I mean, what you're describing, what you're both describing, sounds like an inherently, an inherently exploitative industry. Yes, and of course, the only people, well, not the only, but largely the people who that um, system um, enables is people who are independently wealthy, particularly yeah. in Britain, where the class system is so um, excruciating in any case you end up with institutions being full of artists who can afford to be artists. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, you yeah. know, and so, you know, when we think about culture as being representative of, of society, you know, who is it representing? Mm. And that's why it's so important that artists like Anya are, um, you know, sort of push ahead and push through this because actually, you know, a country like Britain is made up of, you know, incredibly diverse voices with incredibly different experiences. And if we're, if we're setting up a system so that only inherently wealthy people can participate in it, then that perspective is very, very limited. I mean, what you're both talking about is very much putting the, the artist at the centre of the art. And in a way backstage, the film was like that, it was very much about Anya, her process, I, I wonder, though, I was reading one of your papers, Kate, and you talked about um, a, a, comp a blind competition where the judges of the art knew nothing about the artist and that delivered parity in, in awarding sort of the, the winners, a gender parity consistently. I mean, is that the way forward? Maybe we shouldn't know about the artist. Maybe it should be just judging it on the work themselves. Anya, what do you think about that? Oh, wow, I think it's a great idea, <laughs> for <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I think we'll be uh, well surprised by how many female mothers, artists will be in the lead. Um, because at the moment we don't, we don't see that, we don't have an opportunity to judge like that. I also think maybe there is a time for policy changing in some way, uh, uh, but it, we do have to address it. And um, I'm even thinking about some social pressure, how to be more inclusive for female artists in London, maybe introducing a week of exhibitions where galleries are pressured to exhibit female artists only. Um, things that they need to be shaken up. I think living in 2021, we, we are way over that, you know, history where, uh, you know, women had to sit at home and, uh, and wash the dishes unless they want to. Uh, just, uh, you know, we deserve a chance of competing for that space uh, just as much as men do. I think there's a very good reason why change is so slow in the visual arts sector. And that's essentially because it comes down to investment. I mean, you can't just suddenly say, um, oh, you know, those two paintings hanging on your wall, they're now worth the same amount of money. That, work, that works less and that works, you know, like you're talking, yeah. about, you're talking about institutions, you're talking about hundreds of years of collecting practices. So all of this investment, I mean, if we look at, say, one of the biggest galleries in London, Gagosian, um, over the last four years, they've doubled the amount of artists they represent, but they have only improved the number of female artists they represent by 0.2%. Oh my God! Yeah, I so love had your research papers. <laughs> they had 110 chances to address their gender parity, and this is this is in the midst of Me Too, everything else, because of course they know that what sells and what what returns the investment, what collectors look for, is paintings by European male artists, and that is. Um, that is the reality of the situation. So it's the, the new contemporaries prize that you cite as reaching gender paratively consistently over 20 years is an excellent example, but they're, they're artists who don't have any um, provenance as it were. They're artists in an exhibition right at the very beginning of their career. 
Um, and so, you know, it's it's easy to sort of like pull away all of the the, the, the kind of biographical detail and just look at it on the work. But um, I, at the same time, I'm troubled by the idea of having to do that because actually what I think artists like Anya bring um, to the table is, is incredibly interesting. I want to know about her biography and her life. It makes her work richer and more interesting to me. So if we had, as Anya said, policy changes that actually said, right, you know, Arts Council England, if you're going to fund this institution, you need to pay artist fees. If you're going to, um, you know, look at living costs or, or expenses for um, the pro production of artwork, you need to build in um, childcare costs. You know, if we had things in place like that, then galleries wouldn't say, oh, we better not choose yeah. female artists because they're a flight risk. They'd say, it's totally fine to choose a female artist because there's all this infrastructure in place, as we would expect in any workplace in the UK, to make sure that women are not penalised for becoming parents or for being women to begin with. It's, so you're describing a really vexatious uh, sort of um, um, issue within the industry but it, it sounds like there are solutions there so long as we can, you can get the ear of policymakers. we will come back to 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 those elements just a little bit at the end um but i just want to come back now to um some of uh anya's process and we just want to show everyone um a short clip uh, that actually gives us a bit of an insight into anya's uh technique so let's uh, let's have a look at that Uh, there is something so painstaking when I look at that, and I just imagine <laughs> spending hours <laughs> doing that. Oh, although yes. I have no patience whatsoever, so I, I, I am uh, amazed. How did you come up with that with that technique? Speaking as a layperson myself, well, that was done in very safe environment outside with a bottle of water, <laughs> as you can see. Um, to me, it was it was just all about cracks as you know I'm quite fascinating with them, fascinated with them and that was another level of creating a crack uh, that you could see through the light um, especially for, for for the film that you just saw and uh, I think to me just the cracks are very symbolic of who we are in general and and uh, in general and as an artist I find them absolutely intriguing and as, as I mentioned in the film, and then I see self-consciousness, fear, hate, empathy, and I try really hard to humanize them in my work, even by setting fire to them. Um, and uh, they express, I think, how political and life in general uh, affect the spirit. Uh, and to me, they are um, almost an expression expression or external expression of internal dialogues, if that makes any sense. Um, so that was me coming up with another technique of sort of emphasizing, emphasizing the depth of those cracks and also talking about the, you know, how female uh, aspect plays a big role in, in my work. Um, I think that also in, in, in cracks, I, I, um, I think they have a very sort of sonic nature. And that's why I associate them with female essence and female role in the society overall. So I think all of that sort of thinking and confusion and analyzing contributes into techniques and researching new ways of emphasizing them in, in a better way. 
Basically. It reminds me of the Japanese practice of kintsugi, you know, the, the kind of golden repair, um, oh, yeah. you know, that, of course, the cracks become highlighted through this process, but they also become the most beautiful um, aspects of, of the ceramic. And, and yeah. it's this sort of sense of vulnerability and beauty um, together that, um, that really strikes me when I hear you talking about your work. I, I do just want to ask uh, one final question to both of you, and then we'll, we'll take some uh, questions uh, from the floor before we end. Uh, I mean, Anya, where are you? Where do you see your work going next? I mean, what, what next for you in terms of your career and your art? Um, well, I, I'm definitely continuing with my art practice. Um, noted <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna do some live performances around London which is quite exciting and I will keep you updated on that. Um, I'm also getting quite involved into NFT art. Uh, I find it quite fascinating and new and it kind of gives you more freedom in a way. Um, and hopefully I will be able to make some impact or some small positive change towards improving the, the situation for female artists in London. That, um, you mentioned NFTs, non-fungible tokens. We, we didn't actually get to that. It's amazing where the time has gone, but um, Kate, I mean, we're talking about, you know, cracks in Anya's art and to me, um, cracks that can be immovable and unerasable. I mean, uh, is perhaps digital art the way forward for women in terms of changing the industry because they can have total control and can be identified as the artist or not identified as the artist and there's money to be made? Yeah, well, I think one of the really interesting um, projects that's happened, well, started off here in the UK and has now gone global is the... Um, is the artist support pledge that's happened during um, COVID where um, it's essentially got rid of the gatekeeper, the, the gallerist, you know, and artists yeah. have been able to sell their work on Instagram directly um, to audiences for as little as 200 pounds or even less. And it's been extraordinary. I mean, people have built entire collections of the most amazing work during, during COVID. I mean, some artists I've been interviewing have, have talked about they've never earned so much money from their work. Oh, amazing. Because all of a sudden, they've actually been able to sell their work for a little bit cheaper because they haven't had to take into account the 50% cut that the galleries mm. charge. Um, and they've been able to reach these really huge audiences. So I think... Um, yeah, the system definitely needs changing up. And I think, um, you know, social media, digital platforms are, you know, definitely one way to kind of, um, to do that. That's, uh, yeah, that is a really interesting way forward. There's a lot of possibilities there, as well as the government policy, um, potentially uh, around changes that you describe. Um, I'm going to wrap up our discussion there because we do have a question from the floor and uh, this one is for Anya and the question is did the lockdown affect the way you ex express yourself in artwork now? It has. Uh, I went a lot smaller size-wise uh, because I was painting from home and uh, I started making this sort of A5 size, uh, almost like panels that later I, if I put them together, it creates this one big compo composition, I thought. However, they started selling very well and I'm still trying to create that one wall of composition, but it doesn't happen, I guess, because the size is a lot more convenient for people to, to, to buy and put in their homes. So that was an interesting discovery for me because I do like big canvases and I feel free and I can do whatever I want with them. Uh, but being restricted with a small canvas um, played sort of an interesting role in, in, in my artwork and in the process. And it seems to be more popular now than those huge canvases, which is interesting again. That is interesting. I never would have thought that. Yeah. <laughs> I had to completely rethink 
uh, your your approach based on just practical realities. Exactly, uh, what, about, yeah. what about you, Kate? Has that has anything changed for you? Well, um, I've had the unenviable task of having to change an entire degree program to online delivery. So um, <laughs> that's been <laughs> occupying a lot of my time this uh, this last year. But actually, um, as a sort of a consequence, a little bit similar to what Anya describes, I've actually been working on a series of large quilts. Um, where so I couldn't get to my studio because I was homeschooling so I brought my studio home to the sort of probably the kitchen table that you can maybe see behind me there um, and I turned it into a giant sewing table and um, and I was making uh, Im uh, quilts using medical images of my children's bodies that I've been collecting over many mm. many years um, and actually it was just really lovely to um, to sew and to think about that kind of lovely maternal lineage of sewing and stitching and making quilts to keep our families warm. And that felt very, very restorative during COVID actually, when we were all sort of feeling very vulnerable and fragile. And um, so I, I was, I was uh, you know, uh, channeling all those amazing women in our history and, and sitting at home and sewing, um, which was really, really nice. So now I've got these sort of six giant quilts. They're not small like Anya talked about. So God knows <laughs> how they're going to fit on so anyone's you've wall. You've gone the complete opposite way. I, I would love to see those. I, I'm now wondering what I did in lockdown. <laughs> You're both so productive. What did you do, Rachel? I'm not sure. <laughs> I worked. <laughs> I kept going. I just kept doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but I, I'm not an artist, so I, that's uh, that's my excuse. <laughs> there isn't this drive and compel. So, but I think creativity has been incredibly healing, even if it's just viewing mm. it and participating it or buying it for, for people during um, COVID. And I think there's been a revaluing of, like, this thing that's so crucial to society that we don't value enough. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're going to wrap it up because that's all we have time for. I mean, we've been through through incredible um, breadth of issues, but we've done that because those are essentially the, the, the themes in your film. Uh, uh, backstage, Anya, uh, a very nuanced film, and it just touches on, on so many things. And I think we've realised throughout this hour that there's just so much to talk about and just not enough time to talk about it but I do want to thank the people who are still with us thank you so much for joining us uh, you've been hearing from multimedia artist Anya Sand and artist and senior lecturer at King's College Dr Kate McMillan and you saw the first public screening of the film backstage discussing the question does society value the artist behind the art um Thank you so much, uh, both of you. And I do want to remind everyone, if they do want to see the film again, they can now go to Anya Sand's YouTube channel to have a look. And you can also visit her website, anyasandart.com. You can look at more about her art and her career. And if you want to find out more about Dr. Kate McMillan's artwork and her research, you can go to her King's College London website. And she has her own website as well, katemcmillan.net. Um, I'm Reg Ahmed, and uh, thank you so much everybody for being with us today thank, thank you. you thank, thank you very you, much Tanya. thank you